appreciate that. I'm not even going to try and do a voice. <laughs> uh, can I thank you for the invitation to, to come and speak to you tonight, and thank you all for turning up and getting up part of your, your Friday night to uh, to hear what we've got to say. I uh, I normally start these wee talks by explaining that I'm not a nationalist. So, Aaron, thanks, thanks for stealing my thunder on that one. I looked at all your speeches before. I think, it's, I think it's interesting, though, that what you've heard so far from Alan and from the other two speakers hasn't really been an argument founded in national identity. And that's what I mean when I say I'm not a nationalist. For me, I know there are some people who care very deeply and who feel profoundly motivated by feelings of national identity. I think that's true on both sides of this debate. Britishness, Scottishness, <laughs> frankly I feel some affinity with both, and with being European, and with being human. But when my party debates independence, as it has done over the years, the discussions that we have are never cast in terms of national identity. I personally I don't want to undermine the, the feelings of those who, who do have profoundly strong nationalist feelings and find them to be important. But I couldn't give a damn about flags or patriotism or national identity. When my party debates these issues, the question of the governance of Scotland, where best can decisions be made and in whose interest? We're facing a different agenda. We, have that debate. Over the years it's generally been something like two to one, three to one in favour of Scottish independence. It's probably a little bit stronger at the moment because the issue is so alive and so motivating. But whatever the balance is, we then entirely fail to fall out about it because we're defined as a party by a different agenda, not by a constitutional one. And I think the debates that we've had in the Greens about this issue over the years demonstrate that it is possible to have this debate in a spirit of cooperation and constructiveness and friendship. And I think that's something that we all have to try and achieve. It's not easy in the Scottish political landscape, which can be very, very tribal, very hostile. But think about the undecided voters, because right now, where we are just less than six months ago, those are the only ones who count. The undecided voters, the people who are still open to both sides of the argument. I don't think they want to live in a country that's an even verbal war with itself. I think they'll want to live in a country where political activists in communities, political leaders in parliaments and councils and political parties can demonstrate by the tone of their debate that this is a country that can be at ease with itself that this is a country which can achieve confidence in going forward and implementing the decision that the people of Scotland make. Because politicians clearly aren't capable of resolving this question. It's been a dividing line in our politics for far too long. Only the public, through a referendum, can make this decision. And I think those undecided voters will be far more motivated, far happier to hear the argument for a yes vote if they hear it in a tone which is not hostile, which is not tribal, but which is confident about Scotland's ability to go forward together uh, as a country, as a society where we care about one another and where we want to bring all sides of the political spectrum together. Now that's a wee bit optimistic, but there's nothing wrong with a bit of optimism. The, the debates that we have in the Green Party don't tend to be about um, can we do a little bit better at energy policy? Can we do a little bit fairer on welfare policy? If, if the kind of approach you want, the kind of future vision that you have of Scotland is of doing things a little bit better than Westminster, finding policy areas where we could serve Scotland's interest a wee bit more closely or tinker with a policy here, there, or, or wherever around the edges, then you probably would think devolution could be improved a bit. Because right now, the Scottish Parliament has got the responsibility for things like energy efficiency, but it can do nothing to regulate the energy providers who have the, the key responsibilities on cutting demand. We have responsibility for things like uh, debt. We just passed legislation on bankruptcy and debt management. But we can do nothing at all to regulate credit. 
We've got responsibility for many of the effects, the consequences of poverty and inequality. But without access to the tax and benefit systems, we can do very little about the structural causes of poverty and inequality in our society. We've got a, an economy minister, an enterprise minister, who really can do nothing by way of developing an industrial policy because employment and most aspects of business regulation are, are all reserved as well. We've got quite a fragmented system. And if what you want is to manage things a little bit better, you could probably think of a, a better form of devolution, a stronger form of devolution. Whether it's Devo, Nano, Devo, Max, Devo, Plus, Devo in between, there's probably some changes that you could think of making. I find it really hard to, even if I was in that mindset, to think of a, another stronger phase of devolution which doesn't in itself hugely increase the argument for taking control of other issues. The more our economy starts to diverge, if we have different economic policy, different industrial policy, different welfare policy, a different structure of our economy in the future, the argument for representing ourselves on the world stage becomes irresistible. If we have more control of the economy, the argument for representing ourselves in Europe becomes irresistible. If we have separate representation on the world stage, separate po foreign policy, the argument for having the same defence policy is nonsensical. The further we go in devolution, the stronger the argument, not the weaker, the stronger the argument becomes for going the whole hog. And why take that extra stepping stone when we have the opportunity uh, to make the full decision ourselves in just a few months' time? But no, when my party discusses these issues, we don't tend to be the kind of people who want to simply run economic policy a little bit better or represent Scotland's interests a little bit more closely. We're brought together as a political party by a recognition that Scotland, but not just Scotland, the UK, Europe, our whole species is facing unprecedented challenges. Crises, in fact, crises of our own making, an ecological crisis, a social crisis, an economic crisis. Just to think of, of one issue, oil. And I, as I'm on the yes side, I get asked a lot about oil. How can you be on the same side as the SNP when it comes to oil? They love the oil industry. How can you be voting for that, Alex Salmond? Well, I'm not voting for that, Alex Salmond, and I don't support his policy on the oil industry. But the, the vulnerability that Scotland faces from having a large oil and gas sector is not just a problem for Scotland. It's a problem for the UK as well, and for the whole world, but particularly for a country like the UK, who's allowed its economy, large swathes of its industry, to become owned not by either the state or by British private sector interests, but by global finance. By a global finance industry which treats our other industries simply as merchandise to buy and sell, to chop up and trade. That being the case, a vast swathe of the UK's economy is also vulnerable to the carbon bubble. What I mean by the carbon bubble is the hard reality that the world can afford to emit something like five or 600 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere if we want a chance, a decent chance, of handing on a livable environment to the next generation. Unfortunately, we've got something like 3,000 gigatons equivalent of fossil fuel in existing reserves, before we even get into exploration for new fossil fuel reserves, like fracking or like unconventional gas of other kinds, coal bed methane, uh, or like deep water oil drilling. And so the vast bulk of the world's fossil fuel must stay in the ground, or at least be diverted to non-fuel petrochemical uses. So the oil and gas industry, the fossil fuel industries which are valued on those finance markets according to the scale of their reserves, as though all of those reserves can be turned into money, that industry is a bubble. And when that carbon bubble bursts, it will cause economic wreckage that would make the last eight years look like a broken piggy bank. The 
question is not whether oil is an asset to us. The question is how quickly can we break our dependence on oil and gas and our economic dependence on the structures, the economic structures that are based on dependence on that industry. The UK's investments in fossil fuel are leaving the, the UK economy every bit as vulnerable to the carbon bubble as Scotland's. I believe, though, that Scotland would be faced with far greater urgency than the UK yet sees to break its dependence and far greater opportunity to replace that revenue with the revenue from renewable energy. I don't just want to swap polluting energy sources with non-polluting energy sources. I certainly don't just want to swap one bunch of multinationals for another bunch of multinationals. Scotland has the opportunity, well, right now, under devolution, we've probably got the opportunity to do a little bit of investment at local council level and at community level uh, to have a little bit of a stake in, in the energy industry. And we could be doing more. We're not doing enough on that right now. But with independence, we would have the opportunity to build a publicly owned energy industry, the likes of which many other northern European countries, the likes of which Alex Salmond likes to compare us to, many of those other northern European countries take it for granted. Some of them are building renewable energy infrastructure in this country as well. I welcome them, but I just wish to goodness that we had our own publicly owned energy industry to be doing that and channeling the profits back in to serving the common good. Now, whatever proportion of fossil fuels we decide is ecologically responsible to extract, we could be pouring the proceeds of that into something which not only replaces the energy, but replaces the revenue. Let's not see this new nascent industry also snapped up by the same private speculative investors, by the same corporate interests. Let's make sure that the growing renewable energy industry in Scotland serves the common good. And we can do that with the power of independence, which we can't do at the moment. Let's look at the other failures of the UK economy as it stands. We've heard about the chronic inequality in our society, and that's happened under Labour as well as Conservative administrations. That's happened during periods of growth and during periods of recession. You know, the, a, a lot of people are very aware that during the, the recent recession, the wealthiest people have not suffered uh, the, a, a reduction in their wealth in the way that most people have. In fact, many of the wealthiest people have got even richer during the period of the recession. But that inequality was growing even during those years of growth, when we were told that if the economy grows, every benefit. A rising tide lifts all shit. And it was bullshit. It was simple <laughs> bullshit. It was a con. The GDP growth, that, that statistic, GDP growth is, is taken as a proxy for economic health. And it's, it's a piece of nonsense. GDP simply tells you how much money is swelling around in the economy. Now, I'm someone who happens to believe that everlasting GDP growth on a planet of finite resources is simply not going to happen. And that the longer we chase after it, the more damage we will do to society, <coughs> to our, our cohesion as a society, and to the ecological systems that we depend on. But even if GDP growth was going to last forever, it tells you nothing about how that economic activity is being generated, in whose interests is it working. It tells you nothing about the social and environmental costs of that economic activity and who bears it. And all through those years of continuous economic growth, the bulk of the proceeds went to the people who needed it the least. Many of them to hide it away in tax havens. And the bulk of the social and environmental damage that was done through the generation of that economic activity was heaped on those who could defend themselves from it the least. The drive after continual GDP growth as the sole metric that includes all others in our society has been part of the problem. And it's left us with this chronic inequality. So if you take seriously these problems, challenges, I would say crises, the social inequality, the ill economic
economic structure, the sick and, and degraded economic structure, denuded, where our wealth doesn't serve the common good, and the ecological crises that we're facing, of which climate change only happens to be the most famous. It's by no means the only one. It's possibly not even the scariest once you get into it. If you believe that these challenges require a transformation in our society, in our economy, in our politics, and in our values, you don't want to tinker around the edges of devolution. You want to shake up a political system. If I genuinely believed that there was a greater opportunity to do that by voting no, by staying within the UK, trying to change it, I might well be on the no side of this debate. Like I say, flags, patriotism, identity doesn't really do it for me. The prospect of change is what's motivating me here. But let's look at the UK. Let's look not only at the fact that it's a political culture which couldn't even get rid of an unelected house in Parliament after a hundred years of trying. A <laughs> hundred years of trying, for goodness sake. But it's also a political landscape which is being skewed ever more by those interests who've been served the best by the economic status quo. The city of London uh, is not just a geographic area. It's an economic machine and it's a lobbying machine. It's a lobbying machine that's so effective, it's got its own permanent officer in the House of Commons. The Remembrancer for the City of London has complete access to the corridors of power and can have the right quiet words in the right ear, in the right lounge in the House of Commons or in the nearby uh, establishments, some of which I gather are quite fine. <laughs> the UK political landscape is being skewed to the right, as we've heard by UKIP, which is, which is not only an anti-immigrant, anti-foreigner, anti-Europe party. It's fundamentally an anti-politics party. It's capitalizing more than on Euroscepticism or, or fear, uh, artificially engendered fear uh, of immigration and foreigners. It's capitalizing more than that on the cynicism, the understandable cynicism that people have felt for so long about politics. It's essentially an anti-politics party, and that's what I think its, it's rise represents. It's a political landscape in which I don't believe for a moment that Ed Miliband, even if he's a very nice man, which I don't know, I've never met him, but even if he is a very nice man, I don't believe he's capable of delivering a majority in the House of Commons without appealing very directly to that same cynical, right-leaning tendency that's being manipulated by the likes of UK and by some of the Tory benches as well. The Daily Mail tendency, let's call it for shorthand. I don't believe a UK government is capable of forming without leaning in that direction. And that's only going to leave us with yet another uh, attempt at the same formula. Let's kick out the Tories. Let's change the government. We'll have something better. Well, we tried that before and it didn't work. I want to leave you with, with one thought and it has to do with re-engagement. Challenging that notion that politics and politicians is all just a waste of time and why can't we just you know, wallow in our cynicism. Like most MSPs, I've had the opportunity to go into a lot of schools recently. Uh, Alan was, was talking about a, a school he was in. Was that today you were in? Yeah. I've been in more school debates uh, in the last three months or so than I have in, a, in, in the last three, four or five years or so put together. But MSPs on both sides of this debate will tell you that. Lots of schools are seeing the opportunity that they have in front of them not just a classroom of learners, but a classroom of voters as well, for the first time. And they're seeing a responsibility to engage with those voters and an opportunity not just to help them reach a decision about voting yes or no, but to connect them with politics in a way that many, many young voters have not been connected to politics so <coughs> far. And if we can use that, that opportunity of having voters uh, in classrooms motivating them to vote, if we get a good strong turnout of those 16 and 17 year old voters, we know that if you vote first time you're a, a, entitled to, most people keep on voting. If you don't vote the first time you're entitled to, most people just don't start, or at least not until they get a lot older. So we can drive up turnout for the long term. We
we can really reinforce the argument for votes at 16 in elections if we get that good, strong turnout and we can begin to reconnect people with politics. I think, I think that's a profound opportunity, whatever the result uh, of the referendum is, whichever way those young voters choose to cast their vote. But one of the things I've been trying to impress on those young voters is quite how long it has been since people in this country, whether you call that Scotland or the UK, really had belief in the power of politics to change our society for a better place. And I try and explain to them how envious I am, how bored to death I've been of politics for a long, long time now, which has seemed to offer only different flavours of the same basic product, variants on a theme. The opportunity for this generation to ask and answer a defining question, what kind of society do we want to be? Who are we? If we were going to build a country, what would it look like? To be able to ask and answer these kind of questions is a, a really exciting opportunity. And I try to tell those young people about a previous generation, the one that came out of the Second World War, physically brutalized, emotionally traumatized, economically, well, not quite ruined, but pretty close. And they fought together, and many of them had died together, they lost together, and they were determined to rebuild together. And they did lay the foundations of a welfare state and a national health service. They did something to be proud of. They handed on a legacy that made our society a better place. It's, it's heartbreaking to see the way that's been torn to pieces by the UK government right now. It's heartbreaking to see the way it's been torn to pieces with the complicity of the opposition all too often at Westminster. But let's try and imagine the power of ideas at that time. Because we, I think if we're going to win this referendum, and we can, we're not going to do it by explaining to people that they'll be 500 pound richer instead of 500 pound poorer. We're not going to do it by explaining to people that we could tinker with this policy or that policy and, and you know that, that would be a little bit better than devolution. We're only going to do it if we can recapture the idea that politics is capable of making our society a better place and that politics is something for everyone in our society to participate in, to contribute to, not simply to passively receive as though it's a consumer product. And I think if we can recapture that idea, if we can explain to people the opportunity, the, the, the excitement that will come with the, the chance to build the society we wish to live in, then I think we'll win not only a yes vote, but much more than that, the chance to change our politics in that independent Scotland and build a society that the next generation deserve to be able to live in. Thank you very much.